Some say we're getting it all wrong. They argue that instead of establishing bases on the Moon or Mars, we should be aiming for Titan. They even claim that the easiest and most cost-effective way to explore Titan would be to strap on a pair of wings and fly. Thanks to its small size and low density, Titan has a surface gravity that's only 14% of Earth's, slightly less than our Moon. This high ratio of atmospheric density to surface gravity significantly reduces the wingspan needed for an airplane to stay aloft, meaning a human could sustain flight with a type of wingsuit easily manufactured with today's technology. Afraid of falling? Don't be. The freefall acceleration on Titan is seven times lower than on Earth, and the terminal velocity considering air resistance is ten times lower. If you fell from any height, you wouldn't hit the ground at more than 18 kilometers per hour, or about 11 miles per hour. All this sounds amazing, but it doesn't mean that Elon Musk or NASA will be changing their mission plans anytime soon. Unfortunately, Titan is a distant world, 15 times farther than Mars. Its favorable characteristics aren't enough to justify the at least 700 billion it would take to cost to land there, but in just 10 years and with 100 billion, we could plant a flag on Mars. In this video, brought to you as usual by Insane Curiosity, we'll present Titan as it is, listing its advantages and disadvantages. It's up to you to judge its appeal for us Earthlings. Do any of you remember The Puppet Masters, a sci-fi novel written by the great Robert Heinlein in 1951? In it, Earth was invaded by a parasite from the sixth moon of Saturn, which is Titan. Heinlein called it that because at the time, Titan was the sixth known moon of Saturn. Interestingly, Titan can also be considered the sixth moon because after our moon, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, it was the sixth satellite discovered in the solar system. In the novel, Titan was depicted as a dark and hostile world. In reality, this sixth moon has long fascinated scientists and the public alike. Even today, after being closely studied and even visited by a spacecraft, its unique features continue to spark curiosity and pose questions that go beyond pure science. But let's take it step by step. Saturn's largest moon, Titan, is an icy world shrouded by a thick, hazy, golden atmosphere. Titan is the second largest moon in our solar system, only slightly smaller than Jupiter's Ganymede by 2%. It's larger than Earth's moon and even bigger than the planet Mercury. This giant moon is the only one in the solar system with a dense atmosphere and the only other place besides Earth known to have stable bodies of liquid on its surface, including rivers, lakes, and seas. Much like Earth, Titan's atmosphere is primarily composed of nitrogen with a small amount of methane. It's the only other known world with a cycle of liquids raining from clouds, flowing across the surface, filling lakes and seas, and evaporating back into the sky, similar to Earth's water cycle. Titan has a radius of about 1,600 miles or 2,575 kilometers, making it nearly 50% wider than Earth's moon. Titan orbits Saturn at a distance of about 759,000 miles or 1.2 million kilometers, and Saturn itself is approximately 886 miles or 1.4 billion kilometers from the Sun, which is about 9.5 astronomical units AU. For reference, 1 AU is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Sunlight takes around 80 minutes to reach Titan, and due to this vast distance, sunlight is about 100 times dimmer on Saturn and Titan compared to the Earth. Scientists are uncertain about Titan's origin, however, its atmosphere offers some clues. Various instruments from NASA's and ESA's Cassini-Huygens mission measured the isotopes of nitrogen-14 and nitrogen-15 in Titan's atmosphere. They found that Titan's nitrogen isotope ratio closely resembles that found in comets from the Oort cloud, a sphere of hundreds of billions of icy bodies believed to orbit the Sun at distances ranging from 5,000 to 100,000 AU. This nitrogen ratio suggests that the building blocks of Titan formed early in the solar system's history in the same cold gas and dust disk that formed the Sun, called the Proto-Solar Nebula rather than in the warmer disk of material that later formed Saturn, the sub-nebula of Saturn. Like all well-behaved moons, Titan always shows the same face to its parent planet, meaning its rotation period matches its orbital period, which is just under 16 days. 
Titan has a small neighbor, Hyperion, which has been heavily impacted by comets. Hyperion is in a mean motion resonance with Titan. Their orbital periods form simple integer ratios, in this case 3 to 4. And some of Titan's geological and atmospheric features might be due to debris from Hyperion's impacts falling onto Titan. This could be one reason for Titan's unusually thick atmosphere. Hang on a sec guys before we continue. Be sure to join the Insane Curiosity channel. Click on the bell, you'll help us to make products of even higher quality. Let's dive into Titan's biggest mystery, its atmosphere. It's the only moon with such a dense atmosphere composed mainly of nitrogen, particularly in the outer layers, creating an almost impenetrable blanket that blocks nearly all wavelengths of light. Titan's atmosphere is even denser than Earth's, with surface pressure 1.5 times that at sea level on Earth. Despite enveloping a much smaller object, Titan's atmospheric mass slightly exceeds that of Earth. Thanks to the small Huygens probe which descended through Titan's atmosphere in January of 2005, we have a fairly comprehensive understanding of its composition and structure. We know that the stratosphere, the upper part of the atmosphere, is composed of 98% nitrogen, about 1.5% methane and 0.2% hydrogen. There are also noticeable traces of various hydrocarbons like ethane, acetylene and propane as well as other gases like carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. The big question is, how do these fascinating compounds form? The simplest explanation involves ultraviolet sunlight breaking down methane molecules, freezing up atoms to form more complex compounds. And here arises a problem. If methane had an ancient origin linked to a singular event, the sun's action would have completely disassociated it and transformed it into more complex hydrocarbons within just 50 million years, a trifle compared to the lifespan of Titan. So why is it still abundantly present? There is only one answer. Methane continues to originate on the surface and is then carried to the higher regions of the atmosphere. Where does it come from? Likely from the subsurface released by ice volcanoes, the so-called cryovolcanoes, structures widely spread in the outer solar system observed even on Neptune's distant moon Triton, not to mention Enceladus, Io, probably Europa, and perhaps even Pluto and other Kuiper Belt objects. Normally, the heat necessary to expel molten or gaseous material – water, ammonia, methane, etc. – comes from classical tidal effects, like those on Io and Europa. But for Titan, it could also be attributable to the heat still present from the decay of radioactive elements within its interior. An atmosphere of this kind helps maintain relatively high ground temperatures through the greenhouse effect. Methane is an excellent greenhouse gas. However, the upper layers act as a shield and limit the entry of solar rays, causing a reverse greenhouse effect. In any case, in this climatic tug of war, the ground temperature hovers around 175 degrees Celsius. Quite cold, certainly, but let's remember that in Antarctica, temperatures can touch 90 degrees Celsius occasionally. This temperature can easily freeze water, but not methane and its more complex siblings like ethane and propane, which remain comfortably in a liquid state. Indeed, the solidification point of methane is around minus 185 degrees Celsius, and its liquefaction point is around minus 160 degrees Celsius. In short, Titan has the right climatic limits to keep methane and friends in a liquid state. Conditions that make Titan the only place in the solar system where there is something liquid on the surface, besides Earth, of course. And we're not talking about small puddles. The landscape of hydrocarbon lakes is something that seems to transport us to our planet. Some are so large they are called seas, others just mirrors of relative extent. Yet, attractive beaches and coastlines are noticeable, almost inviting one to the classic day at the beach customary here on Earth. Lakes over 100 meters deep nestled atop hills and fed by rain over thousands of years. And then there are phantom ponds that disappear with the slow alternation of seasons. It's not improbable that hydrocarbon icebergs float on them. While witnessing wave motion is quite difficult given the density and viscosity of the liquid that forms them. The lakes, however, are not distributed everywhere but prefer the polar regions, particularly the northern hemisphere. Why is that? At first it was thought to be due to a different topographical configuration, but images from the Cassini probe have ruled this out. 
revealing that the terrain morphology is similar in both north and south. Another hypothesis considers the seasonal variations in temperature. Saturn's elliptical orbit around the Sun exposes parts of Titan to greater amounts of solar light, affecting the cycles of methane, precipitation, and evaporation. During the southern summer, Titan is 12% closer to the Sun compared to the northern summer. As a result, summers in the north are longer and milder, while those in the south are shorter and more intense. In this orbital configuration, the difference between evaporation and precipitation is not equal across seasons. This means there is a net transport of methane and ethane from the southern to the northern hemisphere. This imbalance would thus cause an accumulation of these hydrocarbons and, consequently, the formation of a greater number of lakes in the northern hemisphere. At this point, a closer comparison with Earth is mandatory. Water on our planet is tied to a wonderful cycle, aptly called the water cycle. Water vapor due to heat is extracted from the oceans and carried in clouds, where it condenses and falls back to the ground as rain, which rivers and streams return to the sea, a cycle that is the very life of all terrestrial creatures. Something very similar happens on Titan. Hydrocarbons from the warmer equatorial zones, such as methane, ethane, and propane, turn into vapor that forms thick clouds, which discharge their content in the colder polar areas. A cycle that closely follows the rainy season, which, as we have already said, due to the eccentricity of Saturn's orbit, is longer in the northern hemisphere. Methane, ethane, propane, names that certainly make terrestrial oil companies perk up, but what quantities are we talking about? According to reliable estimates, Earth's natural gas reserves amount to 130 billion tons. Well, on Titan, there are dozens and dozens of lakes, each with an equal availability of methane and ethane. Even Titan's dark equatorial dunes would not be outdone in terms of the presence of organic compounds. According to the study, they would contain a volume of carbonaceous materials hundreds of times greater than all the coal reserves on Earth. The characteristics of Titan's surface also indicate the extreme youth of its garment, no older than a billion years, but probably even younger on the order of 100 million years. Cryovolcanoes and other possible exits for underground matter allow the sixth moon to often change its attire and show very few signs of impacts with comets or other wandering objects. The numerous measurements of Titan's gravity made by the Cassini probe have also revealed that the moon hides an underground ocean of liquid water probably mixed with salts and ammonia. During its descent to the surface, the Huygens probe indeed measured radio signals that strongly suggested the presence of an ocean from 35 to 50 miles or 55 to 80 kilometers under the frozen soil. The discovery of a global ocean of liquid water adds Titan to the handful of worlds in our solar system that could potentially contain habitable environments. Moreover, Titan's rivers, lakes, and seas of liquid methane and ethane could serve as a habitable environment on the lunar surface, even though life there would likely be very different from terrestrial life. Therefore, Titan could potentially host environments with conditions suitable for life, that is, both life as we know it in the underground ocean and life as we do not know it in the liquid hydrocarbons on the surface. Although there is no evidence of life on Titan so far, its complex chemistry and unique environments will surely make it a destination for ongoing exploration. What will the future of Titan be like? Certainly rosier than ours. When the sun increases its radiation, even better when it becomes a red giant, the upper atmospheric layers will disappear, leaving only the denser parts, those most suitable for the warming greenhouse effect. Conditions for life will improve rapidly as even water could remain liquid. A situation not certainly lasting, but that could extend for several hundred million years. Who knows? And now the choice is yours. Is it reasonable to think of this very remote moon as the most suitable destination for solar system exploration? Let us know your opinion 